Good afternoon, everybody. So I'm here to talk about a challenge that all marketeers face in how you use technology to build a better brand, a more impactful, relevant brand for a new age. And I'm going to present a framework um, in, in how we think about this sort of stuff internally and some suggestions and some examples that will show you how technology can help you better connect, better tell stories and better engage with your audiences. So, I guess we should look back a little bit to start with. Since 1941, brands have understood the persuasive value of sight, sound and motion in delivering their message. But it's not really until the 1980s that people started delivering more evocative and emotional storytelling rather than just a practical or a functional message. So if you, th if you look back, you think back to the, the ads that were being created by these guys in the early 80s, if you watch them again, they're still going to resonate today, like this one. When that ad came out, that was like a cultural bomb going off. Everybody went out and bought those jeans. Everybody went out and bought those boxer shorts, which just happened to be the boxer shorts the model wore that day. But it was an emotional message that people could uh, relate to, buy into, aspire to. And in the years after this ad, so, so the, the key tenets of this ad really for Levi's were around six brand values or chords, if you like, around uh, sexuality, freedom, Americanness, originality, and the years after the laundrette, every, every year, twice a year, Levi's would release a new ad that played upon these six chords in a different way, constantly re-expressing and reimagining those brand values. And it worked fantastically well, because this was the 1980s and it was a mass world. So we had mass audiences, mass media, mass communication. If you wanted to watch a music video, then you had to tune in at seven o'clock on a Thursday night to Top of the Pops, just like everybody else. And if you were a brand, you could reach everybody at the same time. But what happens to this world when it becomes disrupted? And actually not only has the reach of this traditional media declined since the 1980s, um, its nature has changed. It no longer sets the cultural agenda. News, more often than not, breaks on the internet, and we are now a series of tribes and, and niches, as Mark mentioned yesterday. And the leaders or the influencers of those tribes are self-made and quite often real and authentic people. We as consumers have unlimited choice, any content, any time, and now any screen. So how does a marketeer reach these audiences, when those channels to the audience are no longer 10, 10,000, but more like 100,000. You could use technology or a digital medium like video on demand or YouTube advertising to extend the reach of your traditional media campaign or objectives. You could take your TV ad and you could put it online and you would reach incrementally more people and it would be cost effective and that would work. But we think that's a little bit boring. You're taking new technology to deliver on old world media metrics. How can this technology be used in a more transformational way? So if we come back to whatever, what our key objective is in, a, in brand building is really winning the hearts of consumers or making your brand a loved brand. And this is the way that we think about that. Finding the right people, telling great stories, and building stronger relationships. And I would suggest in the travel industry, nearly everybody's been fairly focused on the right people and relationships, but actually the telling of great stories has been the domain of big players. 
So traditionally, if you wanted to target your audience, you might say, well, my key audience is an ABC1 housewife, 25 to 45. And a lot of your audience might sit in that set. There are going to be a lot of people in that grouping who are just not interested in your brand or proposition. So we think there are a few key things like data, context, and choice that can actually make this audience business a little bit more precise. So finding the right people through data, you have Google data that says this person has just looked at Tenerife. Uh, this person has just searched, has been watching parenting videos on YouTube. You have your own site data. This person has come to your website, looked at an all-inclusive family holiday, and left again. And you're, and you're tracking those users. You have third-party data. So maybe a retailer said, this person has come and bought a hotel from me. The deal is done for me. I'm just letting the rest of the, or the, the, west of the web audience know that this person's in market for travel. Finding the right people through context. And this is nothing new. This is what press and publications have been doing for a long time. It just exists online constantly and in a more dynamic form. So whether people are looking at travel websites, looking at travel videos, engaging in travel communities, or using travel apps on their mobile, it gives a good indication that they are in market or interested in travel. And the third is around choice. And it's a fairly new concept. So imagine if you could say, to your audience, I've got something to tell you. Um, I'd like to tell you about my, my brand. And you only pay if that audience says, actually, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to listen to you. So th there are two YouTube products that use this invitation to connect. Um, and the, the example I have up here is around Samsung, <coughs> who were launching their new handset, and they were live streaming this event. So they blasted, at the period of the live stream, they blasted all around the web an invitation to connect, an invitation to come and watch that live stream. Now, I'm not part of that tribe, but 2.4 million people chose to do so and were watching that live stream simultaneously, and they had 24 million playbacks. So it's not a tribe I'm part of, but it's a big tribe. Another really good example, and my favorite of this invitation to connect is the true view or skippable ads. So if you've ever sat down to watch some content on YouTube and an ad starts to play and after five seconds you have the invitation to skip that ad and it counts down five, four, three, two, one. You, the advertiser, only pay when somebody chooses to watch to the end of that ad or 30 seconds. And to give you some context, in the UK travel market, that's between three and 10p per engaged user which suddenly makes this just as powerful to the corner pizza shop as it does to a big brand. And this was the medium that Turkish Airlines used. Meshi? Hey, kid. Kobe Bryant? Would you like to have some ice cream, young man? Ice cream? See you. The best fly with Europe's best airline. Turkish Airlines. It's not a viral success for 100 million people. Most of those 100 million views were paid for media views to a relevant audience who said, actually, I like your story. And it's a fairly fair bet, because certainly Turkish Airlines have not been on my radar before, that they've managed to change the perception of that Turkish Airlines product in the minds of a lot of people. So the second part is about telling great stories. And the challenge is to be innovative with new technology to tell the story in a better way. And one of the obvious ways, to me, to tell a better story is to take a little bit more time. So Dove had a really successful campaign, a TV ad, uh, where it, it was around the perception of beauty in ourselves and beauty in others. And it was very successful, but they decided to reimagine that campaign 
um, for the internet without the constraints of a 30 second ad spot. And this is, this is the result. I'm a forensic artist. Worked for the San Jose Police Department from 1995 to 2011. I showed up to a place I'd never been and there was a guy with a drafting board. We couldn't see them, they couldn't see us. Tell me about your hair. I didn't know what he was doing, but then I could tell after several questions that he was drawing me. Tell me about your chin. It kind of protrudes a little bit, hmm. especially when I smile. Your jaw. My mom told me I had a big jaw. What would be your most prominent feature? I kind of have a fat, rounder face. The older I've gotten, the more freckles I've gotten. I would say I have a pretty big forehead. Once I get a sketch, I say thank you very much, and then they leave. I don't see them. All I had been told before the sketch was to get friendly with this other woman, Chloe. Today I'm going to ask you some questions about uh, a person you met earlier, and I'm going to ask you some general questions about their face. She was thin, so you could see her cheekbones. And her chin, it was a nice, thin chin. She had nice eyes. They lit up when she spoke. Cute nose. She had blue eyes, very nice blue eyes. So here we are. This is the sketch that you helped me create. And that's a sketch that somebody described of you. So yeah, that's... She looks closed off and fatter, looks sadder too. Mm -hmm. The second one looks more open, friendly, and happy. Mm -hmm. I should be more grateful of my natural beauty. It impacts the choices and the friends that we make, the jobs we apply for, how we treat our children. It impacts everything. It couldn't be more critical to your happiness. Do you think you're more beautiful than you say? Yeah. Yeah. We spend a lot of time as women analyzing and trying to fix the things that aren't quite right. And we should spend more time appreciating the things that we do like. So if you're delicately wiping your eyes, then my job here is done today. We've made an emotional connection. I'll have to look away so I can keep composed. And I'm really sorry, Daisy, about <laughs> what we've just done to you. My other favorite part of the storytelling piece is the fact that everybody has the story. So I mentioned before that sometimes this storytelling is the domain of the big brands with expensive creative agencies, massive production budgets. And that's just isn't the case anymore and actually the more niche you are the more complicated your product offering the more unique your audience is and actually the richer the story that you have to tell and video production is not if you know where to look like maybe Joel's daughter video production is not the expense that you think it is anymore um, we don't have enough time to show this, but if, uh, if you Google Mo Film Beaver Creek, this is one of the, the best examples I've seen of a sort of a celebration of um, a small independent business. And actually, so it's actually, there's just such great stories in these sorts of businesses. Um, there's no limitation of a schedule. So often, you know, campaign and media is, it has a very short lifetime. This is an example of the Thompson Airways video that was just posted up on YouTube in 2009. And you can see from this green line that it's just been steadily growing in viewership over time. This was never part of a campaign. This was never promoted. People have just stumbled on this content when it's relevant to them. And it lives on for as long as you want it to be there. You can structure a conversation, and it was really easy. Uh, sorry, it was really interesting that Graham was talking about the, the car journey earlier. So, if I'm looking at BMW's website, and I'm looking at their new car, and maybe I'm looking deep into the engine spec, BMW knows 
that when I'm on YouTube a few days later, they can target with me with an ad, with an invitation to connect, with more details around that engine spec. And if I watch to the end of, of that particular ad, they know I'm still sort of in market, and they can continually be feeding me other features of the car that I might find interesting. And as long as I'm choosing to watch those ads, BMW knows that I'm still interested and I'm still in market. And the third pillar is around building stronger relationships. So what's changed is how you nurture the relationship. There's been a lot of talk earlier about this is not a broadcast world anymore, where you're just hoping people are listening. And we talked earlier also around being organized into tribes and communities. How can you align yourself with some of these tribes and communities that exist on the web and on YouTube um, where you have shared values? So in the case of Ocado partnering with Jamie Oliver, they are saying, we value good quality home cooked food just like you do. And as Jamie view Jamie's viewers are there with their tablets in their kitchen running through recipes, Ocado is there turning your customers into advocates, which I think is a really interesting one for travel, but not one I've seen a great example of yet. I think GoPro are one of the best examples of this in this space. I mean, GoPro are the guys that invented the little action camera you stick on your helmet and you ride your, your mountain bike downhill. Now, they invited all of their users to submit their content to their channel. They now have 1.2 million subscribers to their channel on YouTube. And these guys have gone from being a camera manufacturer to a very powerful um, media, sports media channel. And these relationships are recognized through, are accelerated through recognition. So there's been a lot of talk of data. And even earlier when I was talking about cookied users, and this slide brings it to life a little bit more. If you know these things about these people, when you're next communicating with them, when they're next at your website, how does that change the conversation that you're having with them? Technology allows you to have that individual conversation. And this is as far removed from the 1980s mass world, mass message as possible. So the key things are finding the right people, telling great stories, and building strong relationships. It's not, it, we try to keep that bit simple. We think that it would be a shame if new technology is used to deliver incremental value to media metrics that were important in the 1980s. We feel that it could actually drive transformational opportunities uh, for brands and for more businesses. Thank you for your time.